Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for joining us for today's Global Health History Seminar. Um, seeing so many of you having a full house, of course, is a reflection also of the speakers we have today, but it's, it's wonderful to see you and to also see some colleagues from other UN agencies. The Global Health History Seminars are a global initiative, and this is the third time that the European Regional Office for Europe is hosting this. And it is an initiative that uh, is uh, born out of the, the mind of one of our strongest collaborators, that is the WHO Collaborating Center at the University of York for Global Health Histories. And Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya is in charge of running them, and is running them with the generous support of the Wellcome Trust. Today's title is very exciting. Um, it is exciting not only because it deals with Ebola, but it deals with exploring the cultural context of an epidemic. And you will next month have another seminar on cultural context in relation to migration. Now, the cultural context of health has uh, been given a, a completely new lease of a life in WHO Europe. Um, as you may know, we have a work stream on cultural context of health and well-being in the office, which is led by Dr. Niels Fietje. And this work is now really gaining momentum. How does culture impact health? How does it benefit or perhaps hinder health? All of this is being explored uh, in the regional office through a new initiative that Dr. Fietje is leading, and that is very generously supported also by the Wellcome Trust. And it is for that reason that we're extremely proud to have um, as our speaker today, Dr. Jeremy Farah, the director of the Wellcome Trust, who will expand on this issue. Of course, we're also extremely happy to have our regional director with us. Um, Dr. Jakob will also give her views and the European region's vision in that regard. But last but not least, we have, of course, um, also another expert with us, Dr. Joao Nunez from the University of York, who is a lecturer in international relations, and he will provide us with his perspective. But, of course, nothing would be complete without also a WHO speaker. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Gagnel Rodier, who is director of DCE. You all know what DCE means. We are in the acronym world. Who will then also expand on his experience and the cultural context of Ebola from his time in Africa and his long experience in the area of infectious diseases. So, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, who I believe is the regional director for Europe. Dr. Jakob, you have the floor. So, first of all, thank you to Claudia for organizing this. It's a very great event today, and also this sequence of Global Health Histories events. Nice initiative. And thank you all the speakers who are here with us, particularly Jeremy, but also Joao, and I'm very much looking forward also to Gunnar's experience who has spent such a long time in uh, the affected, Ebola affected countries. So let me say that, first of all, our health is very strongly influenced by the cultural context, as we all know. And this is an issue that was also discussed recently in the regional committee when we were discussing the determinants of health. Cultural determinants. Uh, was highlighted very strongly in the paper that we put forward to the regional committee, to our member states. And there was a very strong acknowledgement that both the national context but also the cultural determinant play a very significant uh, role in how our health and health experience is uh, formed. And over the past uh, 20 years, a lot of conceptual frameworks have been developed mainly on economic and social determinants of health. And they all indicate that the pathway to health and inequities, inequalities, is not a linear pathway, but it's a very complex pathway. And that the diversity of the human context in which health is created and is determined plays a very important role. And a growing number of people acknowledge this, and health community has acknowledged this in the last few years, and they have been calling for more extensive work in this area, and particularly on the role that the cultural context plays in the provision of health and also in the provision of equitable health care. And in November last year, many of you may recall that the Lancet has published an extensive commission report 
uh, on culture and health, in which the claim is made that the neglect of culture is the single biggest obstacle to developing equitable health care. And WHO Europe was part of this panel and also part of this publication. Uh, as we discussed earlier with Jeremy, in our region, Health 2020, the European policy framework, has initiated a shift in several strategic approaches. We are investing quite a lot these days into uh, upstream approaches, particularly into determinants of health, which also includes the cultural determinants beyond the lifestyles, behavior, or social, economic, and all the others. We are investing a lot into equity issues, into new strategic directions like life course or the resilient communities. And all this requires, as we all know, intersectoral approach, interdisciplinary engagement, and whole of society approaches. And HES 2020 has reintroduced also well-being, which we are very proud of. So therefore, we are looking at health according to the WHO definition of health, as it is put down in the WHO uh, constitution. And um, we have also opened the door in that context to a more systematic engagement in the cultural context. Of course, it means that beyond our usual stakeholders and partners, we have to reach out to health-related humanities and also to social sciences. In order to tap into this rich resource, the regional office recently has launched a project which is called the Cultural Context of Health. This CCH project, the Cultural Context of Health, is creating a platform which aims to systematically apply intersectoral and interdisciplinary research at the interface of culture and health to promote and facilitate the implementation of Health 2020. As an early, as an early entry point, uh, the CCH has focused on how to measure and report on well-being in the culturally diverse European region, where ideas about what constitutes well-being differ widely. An expert group on CCH has been established, and the report from its first meeting was published in a report which is entitled Beyond Bias, Exploring the Cultural Context of Health and Well-being Measurement. Well-being and its cultural context is also one of the chapters in our recently published European Health Report, uh, which was just launched in the Regional Committee in 2015. And needless to say that Ebola has shown us how important the cultural context is. And similarly also, migration and health has shown us and will show us the importance of cultural context. So I'm very pleased to hear, Claudia and uh, colleagues, that this will be the topic of a seminar in one month from now. Cultural practices by local populations, particularly the burial rituals, played a crucial role in transmitting the Ebola viral disease, and I'm sure we will hear more about it, both from Jeremy and also from Gunnell. WHO recognizes that the design and management of any outbreak response also needs to reflect the cultural context based on adequate anthropological knowledge and community engagement. In order to build more locally appropriate and socially informed responses to any acute health threat, whether it is Ebola outbreak or any other infectious diseases, advice is needed that engages with crucial socio-political and political dimensions. Also, a better understanding is needed on the positive role that the culture can play in promoting resilience in the communities that are faced with particular healthcare challenges and health challenges. So before I pass on to the speakers, I would like to express a few thanks. Uh, first of all, big thank you to the experts who are invited today and who accepted our invitation. 
to speak to us in the upcoming time. And we are extremely grateful to uh, being here with us and to share their thoughts. In particular, I would like to express thanks to Jeremy, Professor Jeremy Ferran, and the Welcome Trust for their trust and support in the past years and the, uh, in the upcoming period also to the WHO project on cultural context in health. But I would like to express thanks also to Gunnar, as I said already, for the many months that he spent in the affected countries. So with this, without much ado, I would like to hand it over to the speakers and thank you again and tell you that we are very much looking forward to the upcoming one and a half hours or so. Thank you very much. That may be a bit better. <laughs> thanks very much for um, giving up your lunchtime to, to come and meet. Um, and thank you, Dr. Jacob, for that very um, nice introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation to come. And Welcome Trust is delighted to support these uh, seminar series. And, and um, I'll go on in a little bit to explain a bit more about the Welcome Trust. But, but we would very much like to extend and grow our links at a global level with organizations and obviously the World Health Organization is the critical player in this and, and what we can do to, to strengthen the partnerships that we already have in the coming years we would very much like to explore. It's my first visit to WHO Euro, it's um, uh, lovely to be here. Uh, I Just a little bit of my personal background, um, I do carry a British passport um, but I was born in Asia and I've spent almost 70% of my life in Asia. Uh, I spent the last 18 years living in Vietnam. Uh, I'm a clinician, uh, infectious disease background, uh, and two years ago gave up uh, life in Vietnam for a daily commute between Oxford and London, which if any of you know that commute, it's miserable, um, uh, and became the head of the Wellcome Trust about uh, just on two years ago now. Uh, so that's my uh, personal background. And over the last 10 years, having uh, became very involved since SARS and uh, one of your colleagues, Carlo Abani, was a very, very close friend of mine um, and who tragically died, of course, of, of SARS in, in Bangkok, acquired in Hanoi. But it was that experience and the bravery of Carlo Abani who really made my interest shift uh, in my research career to taking a big interest in emerging infections. Um, and Carlo did a remarkable thing and actually protected the country of Vietnam, a country of 90 million people, who would have been devastated by SARS had it not been for the actions of uh, Dr. Urbani in closing the hospital in Hanoi and as a result, losing his own life, um, but protecting a whole country. And just before I start, just like to pay tribute. Many people here in the room have spent a lot of time in West Africa over the last 15, 18 months and pay tribute to everybody that's done that and the people that are still there because the epidemic is not over yet, despite this being, I think, the first week in a very long time that all three countries are free of Ebola. Uh, nobody should think that this epidemic is over yet. And pay tribute to everybody in the room that has been there and, of course, to colleagues at organisations such as MSF who have taken such a leading role in this and tribute to all the friends and family of the individuals recently killed in Afghanistan. Um, so as we speak, I think we should keep in mind all those individuals. I'm really only going to say two things um, in the next 15 minutes or so. That is that I think we live in a remarkable era, um, a remarkable period of history when, when the world is changing at an unbelievable pace. And all of our organisations, the World Health Organisation here in Copenhagen uh, and my own organisation needs to adapt to that. And the second half of the talk, um, being cheeky to talk about where the World Health Organisation may go in the future. Uh, and you can ignore that bit if you wish. Wellcome Trust, um, established about 80 years ago uh, by Sir Henry Wellcome, an American who became nationalized, nationalized to be British and so became a Sir, um, left a legacy which at the time was relatively small and of course the Wellcome Company which the charity owned. In the late 1980s that was sold and it became an independent charity with no links to any other organization. Uh, we have our own 
endowment. We're lucky that that is in the ballpark of about 25 billion euros currently. And we aim, we hope, in the next five years to be able to support uh, research around the world to the tune of about seven or eight billion euros. Uh, we've uh, increasingly, and of course, it partially comes from my own background, wanting to take a global perspective and wanting to contribute to that global agenda as we go through a period of change. And if there are things that we can do together in the future, then our doors are open. We are based in London, but it's not that far from Copenhagen. There is good coffee. Most of the people in the Wellcome Trust are nice. Um, and you're very welcome to come and see us. And we hope that we will be invited here again. Although after you hear the second half, you may not. Um. <laughs> So we live in a period of remarkable change, and there are many, many drivers of this. Um, and I think I'll come back to Ebola in a minute, because I think it sort of epitomizes some of that, that change. Of course, some of the changes are, are, are around the environment. The environment is changing at a, a fast pace. And if the current issues of migration within Europe, I do not think are an isolated instance. And the movement of people, because driven by inequity, driven by conflict, driven by political instability, is going to become a feature of all of our working lives. And we need to be able to work collectively to be able to deal with that. Travel and trade is pushing the boundaries of nation states uh, beyond their capacity to cope. And as a result, people are moving on, a, on an unprecedented scale and an unprecedented pace. We've also got health systems around the world, which in many parts of the world, not necessarily here in Western Europe, but many parts of the world were established in an era of infectious diseases, when in all reality, and this was my background, mostly quite young people got infected, they came into a clinic or hospital, they either died very quickly or got better and went home. The new world of health is a very different one. And many countries, not so much Western Europe, who was able to reduce the burden of infectious diseases before the rise of the non-communicable diseases became so obvious. But many parts of the world, Vietnam is an example of this, Sierra Leone is another example, and the, the vast bulk of the world are now having to deal with the double burden of non-communicable diseases and infectious diseases at the same time in a way that Western Europe never had to do. And the health systems around the world on the whole are geared towards that more short-termism, which is the nature of infectious diseases. And unless those health systems change and adapt to this new world order, then I think we will continue to see uh, systems that are not resilient to the surge that is needed occasionally as things change and as things develop or as people move and change the, the pattern of burden of diseases. And Ebola is an example of that. 12,000 people or so have lost their lives, that's people confirmed, but inevitably the burden is far bigger than that. The virus has not changed significantly since Peter Piot dropped a vial on his foot in Antwerp or wherever he was in 1976. The virus has not changed dramatically. What changed is the cultural context in which it occurred in 2013, 14, 15, and who knows about 2016. The health systems were not resilient enough to cope with that, and Sierra Leone, Guinea, uh, and Liberia are examples of countries all around the world with, those, um, with fragile healthcare systems. And the society in which it occurred has changed as well. A rural outbreak in DRC in 1976 is not the same as an outbreak in the middle of Freetown in 2014. Societies are different, the way societies work together are different, the way individuals within those societies uh, behave is different. The average uh, number of contacts in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in 1976 of a single Ebola case was somewhere between seven and 11. In 2014, that was 150 or so. And so the, the response to it cannot look backwards and think, how did we respond in 1976? But it has to be forward thinking. History doesn't repeat itself. It does rhyme, and there are lessons to be learned from history. But we have to think forward, not backwards. And in our thinking about how to put in systems in place, both to prepare for and then respond to, we need to look at the world as it is today and will be in the future, rather than the world uh, as, we, as it was. And Ebola is not an, a, a rare event. In the decades since Carlo Avani lost his life um, or so, there have been a series of these epidemics, some of them national, some of them regional, some of them global. And throughout each of these, we have, in the main, failed to prepare and respond to them, despite years of preparation. SARS, 
Nipah in Malaysia, now in Bangladesh, H5N1, H1N1, MERS in the Middle East at the moment remains a major cause of concern. We don't, after three years, understand what the zoonotic reservoir is. We don't have an adequate treatment. We don't have a vaccine. And we're not sure of what the epidemiology is, human to human or animal to human. That's unacceptable in the 21st century. So we need to be able to have systems that allow us to both prepare for and act uh, and the WHO needs to be at the center of that. Public health is also changing, and one of my major concerns coming back to Europe after being away for almost 20 years is that increasingly, as we educate young people who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow, we are educating them in silos uh, in a way that we did in the 19th century but is not acceptable in the 21st century. We are isolating, even within public health, which should be, public health should be perceived across the whole spectrum of 21st century public health. It isn't just about classic public health. It has to embrace, yes, the social context of health. Yes, uh, the society in which it operates. But it also has to embrace modern genomics, modern in, uh, in information technology, uh, social media, uh, the way societies are structured and organized. And it has to embrace vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics. And I worry that as we increasingly train people in silos, uh, we, we are going to lose that capacity uh, to bridge between areas. I think one of the greatest tragedies of the 19th century, uh, it's my real only criticism of Louis Pasteur, was that we invented public health, divorced from clinical medicine and from other areas of, of science. And we need to bring those back together again uh, so that we don't see a magic bullet which can only answer the problem through the delivery of a vaccine or a drug or indeed through delivery of social change. We have to somehow blend these together, and it's individuals that will blend them together as part of systems, and I think it's young people that will blend those. Uh, and if we don't educate people in that broad approach, I think we will continue to go down the silos that will ultimately uh, hamper our ability to deliver health care to the, those who need it most. What is the role of the WHO in this? Well, there is, as you're aware, uh, a crisis of confidence, I think, at, at, in, with, in the World Health Organization at the moment, and Ebola has put tremendous strains on the organization. There is no doubt that all of us, all of us around the world, with the possible exception of, uh, well, with the exception of the brave individuals who responded very early, and I th again think MSF deserves great credit for that, but it wasn't just a failure of the World Health Organization. We all failed, it was a collective failure governments, national organizations, and supranational bodies. And the, the first phase of the epidemic, from the start of the epidemic, in those first few, year first few months, was clearly uh, a very bad time. I do think that the second phase of the epidemic, when the, the world responded, uh, and I'm talking now from August, September, October of 2014 until the present time, actually many, many individuals, and including the World Health Organization, deserve great credit, because I think the world did manage to turn the epidemic around, and if it hadn't acted as it is, the epidemic would still be going on. So although there is a crisis, crises are also a remarkable opportunity to bring about change, because it is a dawn of a realization in a relatively conservative world where we can bring about change when you, are, when you are accept and identify that a crisis has happened and it's a time to change. The World Health Organization, along with the United Nations and many other world bodies, of course, was set up in the 1940s after the Second World War when there was a great desire to do things in a different way. I think the World Health Organization and other organizations need to come up into the 21st century. Uh, there needs to be very strong leadership. The nation, nation states, which is the WHO's greatest strength, the fact that you are representative of your member states, the member states have to be willing to be led. They have to be accountable as nation states and they have to be held accountable and the WHO needs to be more, in my view, than a managerial secretariat and needs to be given the authority and backing of its member states to provide leadership. The world is desperately searching for that inspirational public health champion that holds countries to account, is accountable, and that's very important, uh, but I think the, the, the future of the WHO is incredibly bright if it grasps that mandate and then lives with it. And there would be huge support for the organization doing that. 
you currently have a director general who is has two more years in the role and I think there's a certain amount that Margaret Chan will be able to achieve in the next two years but of course the reality is the major reforms that major new era is going to become to the the, the next director of the of the WHO and that is a really crucial appointment and it is time to move whether you're at the WHO or the IMF, or the World Bank, or any of these other agencies, it is time to move away from, uh, from somebody else's turn, somebody else's regional office term, or whatever. It's crucial that the best individuals are in these posts, uh, because the world cannot do without a very strong World Health Organization. Yes, there were mistakes, as I, as I mentioned, but as the world increasingly fragments, and you can see this in the geopolitical restructuring of the world that's going on at the moment, uh, the change in dynamics, the rise of the BRIC countries and other countries around the world, the world is going through a period of profound change after having, actually, a period of fairly, uh, fairly stable geopolitical structures. That is changing, and that is a time when these global bodies need to be ever stronger. That is not, a, as the fragmentation occurs, uh, in influence, it's critical that the member states are represented at the central body which look after all of us rather than looking after the few. And your capacity to be representative and lead those member states I think is absolutely uh, crucial and there is no greater need for that solidarity, that um, equity is at the heart of that, access to the benefits uh, that can come from this golden scientific age uh, and that you are the organisation to pull it together. You I believe you need to grasp that, I believe you need to be held accountable for that, uh, and you also need to hold the member states accountable for their actions. Uh, the world has never needed a stronger WHO than it needs today. There is much to consider about the whole structures of the WHO, uh, the regional offices, the national office headquarters, etc., etc. but I think that is for another day. I do think the next two years there is something that can be achieved coming out of the Ebola crisis that pulls together in a organization, you are one organization, you're in Copenhagen or in Geneva or in the national offices, but you have to be a single organization because that is your greatest strength. And you have to speak with us as a single organization. Uh, I do believe that the Ebola has taught us that if we don't pull together surveillance, uh, the international health regulations, the capacity to uh, review those, and for member states to meet their commitments and to be held accountable for those commitments and to be able to verify those commitments and the WHO to be accountable for doing that. Uh, I do think that needs to be pulled together in, a, in an entity which is protected from budget cuts, has its own director that reports to the Director General of the WHO and which is held accountable for preparing for emergencies. An autonomous unit within the World Health Organization family whose, uh, whose governance is independent and transparent and is held accountable for preparing for and, and responding to epidemics. And that needs to pull together everything I talked about at the beginning. This isn't just about uh, a technological solution. This isn't just about another vaccine. This is also, though, just not about uh, discussing the cultural aspects of health. This is about pulling it all together. And one of my worries, as I say, is that if we spread that out too thinly in any organization, uh, we risk siloing each of those and we don't pull them back together again. Uh, as we are with the international health regulations, which were a milestone uh, in WHO's history, still two-thirds of countries within it do not meet their commitments within the international health regulations. That should be unacceptable. And we do need to hold countries to account, and we do need to, to change the incentives and disincentives, uh, and we need to be able to better share uh, the benefits of meeting those commitments than we do at the moment. At the moment, there are too many disincentives and blames uh, if one uh, is, is responsible for dealing, preparing for and dealing with uh, epidemics. Uh, so the WHO's role to convene, to share knowledge, to ensure that rich countries don't dominate everything and that there is uh, equity uh, and solidarity, I think, is absolutely critical. And WHO's role as a normative functions in setting priorities and holding countries to account. So very much of what was in the stocking report and I think will come out of the Institute of Medicine report and the Harvard Lancet London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine report, I do think needs to be embraced. And I do think this is the time when member countries would be absolutely willing 
uh, to back in a new way the World Health Organization. And it isn't just about member states. As the world changes, I think non-state actors become also a very critical player in this. Civic society becomes a critical player. And again, World Health Organization could be the forum uh, and with the authority uh, that would bring these uh, together. So to finish off, we are in a period of profound change, uh, the environmental change, the social change that's going on at the moment, the political changes that are going on that I'm sure we'll hear of more uh, in the future. But that is also a period of profound opportunity and a new way of working which through the dreadful tragedy of Ebola gives us an opportunity to change the way we do things, to redefine the roles of global bodies of which the WHO for me is the critical player and needs to provide that leadership. The 21st century will bring challenges that we have never faced before, but we are also at the dawn of a golden scientific age. And I use science there in its broadest sense that includes social science, it includes demographic shifts, it includes urbanization and travel, and also includes genomics and vaccines and drugs. We should not be separating them, we should be pulling them together. I think the World Health Organization has got a unique moment in history when it could seize that chance and through the last two years of Margaret Chan's period, I think and hope she will, and I think for the new Director General, uh, that's a critical role that she or he will need to play. And that's a responsibility that we are all willing to contribute to. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Jeremy, because you mentioned the uh, WHO, and I was actually together with David Eman leading the semi-independent division for 15 years, dealing with outbreaks response, dealing with SARS, dealing with the revision of the IHR, and I'm pleased to see that this is not forgotten. And in particular, uh, I would like that we build sometimes more on what was successful before and not just looking at what went wrong this time. But anyway, this, <laughs> I'm saying that because there's a lot of things experience within the organizations. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I want, first of all, to acknowledge the WHO, Euro, Ebola team, because I know there are many in the room, um, from uh, Christiana to Colleen to others. So please, uh, I'm going to be a bit more with slides, a bit more technical sometimes, uh, just feel free to interfere or to, to ask, to, to comment. Um, I have my slides here, I don't know if I should, uh, yeah, it works. Okay, first of all, when it comes to uh, the cultural context, what is probably important is to, it's just, it's just these slides, because this slide is about the simp simply the, the cycle of, uh, of Ebola, how Ebola gets uh, into community. And what is interesting here is to realize uh, it comes from the wild, it comes from the dark forest, it comes from monkeys, and all these things play a role in our own perceptions. There is a lot of misperception about Ebola, depending on our culture, being uh, Africans living in the forest uh, in Guinea, for instance, or ourselves going to, uh, to respond to an outbreak of Ebola. There is this, a lot of misperception. So part of this cultural context is actually to understand what Ebola is about. Um, there is a wide cycle of Ebola, in the forest with an animal reservoir, not proven 100%, but 99.9%, uh, which are uh, fruit bats. And these fruit bats simply could infect, through various mechanisms not fully understood, could infect monkeys, usually small monkeys, and as you do big monkeys on the ground, or other games that could be infected. They could infect a man, typically a hunter, or a charcoal maker, or somebody who lives in the forest, and cut trees, or, uh, that's often the case. And then it goes to the community and it's amplified. And what is interesting is to see why it's amplified. It's amplified, we can say, about uh, traditional uh, healers and funeral practices. But in fact, more importantly, it's amplified by hospital and by the health system itself. So all large outbreak we've seen, have also, I mean, we see that the health system is actually uh, playing a major role in the uh, amplification of the epidemic. No need to go into detail, but this slide now to show you that this is not a huge surprise uh, to have Ebola in West Africa. For many, many years, we know actually that the range of Ebola, and we know a number of zero positive surveys in West Africa, but 13% people were positive for flaviva, uh, antibodies against um, <coughs> 
filoviruses. And then uh, we know also the range of these fruit bats, and we know we even have a strain of Ebola called Ivory Coast or Typhoid. So we know Ebola has been around for many, many years. So in a way, it's a lack on our side, I mean, a lack of, uh, of preparedness, because we knew it could have occurred, occurred there. So it wasn't, a, in practice, it should have not been a total surprise. When it comes to the features, so you have to forget about the Ebola uh, movies and uh, outbreaks and so on, because in fact, most Ebola patients do not have hemorrhage. So already when you, you, when you wait to have hemorrhage to think about an Ebola patient, that is not going to be the case. Most of the time, our Ebola outbreak has been, the alert has been given by acute diarrheal disease with or without blood, but with high mortality, high fatality rate. And that really should ring the bell in an area where we know we have Ebola endemic. So again, a small outbreak, diarrheal diseases, with high mortality above 50%, there's certainly something going wrong and it could well be Ebola or even Marburg. There is no real treatment. As you know, we try actually in Guinea and elsewhere some, uh, some uh, antivirals, but didn't work so well. But the good news is there is a good vaccine that seems to be uh, soon available. Another thing to understand, it's relatively without any sophisticated tools to control an Ebola outbreak, in fact. Uh, and we show you that we have done it in many places before and successfully. So why it went wrong this time, I don't know, but the, the, the recipe is relatively simple. It's very much people-centered. Each case, each contact is a person and need to be on board and need to be looked at very closely. And to break this chain of transmissions, as you can see, just put an example here, you just need to know around the patients who has been in contact with this particular case. And then you need to follow them up for three weeks. When it's done properly, people actually are reassured to be followed up because some otherwise they are concerned that they could get the disease. So seeing a nurse every day or doctors every day, many are actually playing the game relatively easily. Usually, that will happen at least in many of the previous outbreaks. And then if nothing happens, it's fine. It's not highly transmissible. It's only, only one out of 10 contacts that will actually develop symptoms. So it's not... And there is a, I often say there is a, an element of luck because of when contact disappears, if you're lucky, uh, nothing will happen. If you're not lucky at all, it could be the time bomb that this particular contact will develop symptoms and create another outbreak elsewhere. But it's very much people center the response and it normally works pretty well as long as you have the community with you. Just to give you an idea of previous Ebola outbreaks that were mentioned by Jeremy earlier, uh, I'll show the, on the bottom, there is one that I put in red, actually the one that allowed to dis discover Ebola at that time, the two outbreak in 1976, uh, which allowed to realize there was a, uh, but they were no, we were not in the middle of this outbreak. Uh, uh, we were not in the middle of responses. The big response started in 1994, 1995, in uh, Kikwit, former Zaire, when we had a large outbreak, which was actually, and I'm sorry, I always have to say it, it was an urban outbreak, uh, Kikwit is about 450,000 inhabitants. It's not a village. And the fact the, or the argument that it is completely new that we have an urban environment, I think it's totally wrong. We had uh, previously outbreaks in cities. Uh, we had cases in even in some Gabon outbreak which are mentioned here. We had uh, cases in Libreville. Uh, so it's not totally new. I don't know why this one went totally wrong. Also in Guinea, we managed not to have in Conakry, the situation we had in the two other capitals. In the, in the little square on the left, I just show the one I was directly myself involved in the field from 95 to 2000, and then as director of the divisions, at that time the one I supervised but was not present uh, on site necessarily. So just to show, WHO has a lot of experience and it went well uh, for, for many years. A classic Ebola outbreak, you go on site, you analyze, you investigate, and usually when you reach the peak and you start to control, you have to control roughly three months up to the last case that you're relatively confident. That was a Gulu uh, outbreak in 2000-2001. In and then you count this twice the maximum incubation period, twice 21 days without a case, and then you close the file and you assume it's over. So that's normally what we, we do. Um, the context, of course, is certainly important, and why we have this largest Ebola outbreak ever, where we see people dying in the streets, that we virtually never seen that before. Uh, to be honest, I still don't understand very well what really happened. 
Um, it did not happen the same way in Guinea, but certainly in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia, is the fact that maybe there were virtually no capacity in the, dis in the district far away, and then people went directly to the capital city, and then uh, being completely unprepared, and then it was amplified in local health uh, units. Maybe, that, maybe that's the explanation, and then it went completely out of control, because above a certain threshold, you can no longer follow the contact very, in an organized way and then things become totally disorganized and could go uh, quickly out of control. Interestingly, for instance, it spread to Mali, to Senegal. I mean, I went myself to Senegal to address the Senegal issues. Um, but he went to Mali, to Nigeria, to, to Spain, but I will just take the Nigeria example or Mali example in a similar African context, and they were managed. So that means it can be managed even in, in relatively uh, poor infrastructure. The situation today that from uh, Guinea, that was where we have the last cases at the 5th of October, two days ago, three days ago. So we are, uh, we are not yet there. In fact, we're reaching, you see in red, eight days is exactly the time when we expect contact to develop symptoms. Most of them will develop symptoms around, around a week after being exposed. So in fact, we are just in the middle, of, in Guinea, in the middle of the hot, uh, hot zone. Uh, if nothing happened in the next two weeks, we'd be maybe on the safe side. I don't raise the issues of re-emergence of the virus now with convalescent. We have large cohorts, uh, more than 4,000 people who are cured from Ebola. We, in fact, some of them, uh, we're not going to die, but still can still carry the virus. And we still seen in Liberia recently and Sierra Leone some cases that may well be linked to that and not to a chain of transmission not interrupted. Um, the contributing factors in this West African crisis, um, well, you can say it was undetected for three months, but if you look at previous outbreaks, you always have a certain length of time between detections, I mean, between the f retrospectively what was the index case and then the, uh, the, the diagnostic with the lab. So it takes a while. This is not totally new. Um, there was an alert given on 26 January, typically actually five deaths with diarrhea, and that really start, should have... Sh if we had actually, if we, were, we have been in DRC, they would probably have jumped on it and say it could well be Ebola. But probably in the context of West Africa, they did not think about it, but that's the way it is. Um, on the 14th March, there was a, a mission on site with the uh, Minister of Health, WHO, and MSF. And then the lab comp confirmation on 21st March. I think nothing went totally wrong there, except this alert that was not picked up uh, as a potential Ebola, probably due to the lack of awareness. Um, contributing factor, of course, baseline weak health system, but it is the case actually in DRC, if you go to, the, to a number of prefectures in DRC, if you go uh, other infrastructure weaknesses, the ushers, particularly uh, during the rainy season, uh, it's, it's a headache actually to travel, and Guinea is actually very large, it's, uh, it's uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone combined, so it's, transportation is, could be a, a major issue. But that's... Uh, in a way, the, we had similar context before. The way to protect yourself from Ebola, and that was given to the population, this is typically don't touch. The problem is, the second poster I show you is uh, wash your hands and uh, tell uh, to the health center that you have a patient. But this is very much in fact, and it was, I was almost shocked when I arrived in Conakry because it, the whole poster in the city were more about a cholera response instead of an Ebola response. Uh, it was all about you close the school, you wash your hands, and you're on the safe side, which is actually totally wrong in an Ebola response. So it takes, so, and this message here, which is correct in a way, you wash your hand, you, that's fine, but if you are on site from the local community who every year has a cholera outbreak, they don't understand why this one is so different. And then they will not understand why we cannot touch the dead anymore. Why do you uh, force her to have so many new features to, to deal with the patients compared to what we are used to? Because when you say epidemic, well, all epidemics are epidemics. They don't make necessarily a difference between the different uh, causative agents. So I think there was some kind of mis, uh, I don't know, misled uh, even the authorities on, on this. Contributing factors, of course, uh, strong social customs that help spread the disease. We can come back to that. Low community awareness, uh, they develop uh, resistance, hostility, even violence. We'll come back on that. But overall, you can say delay, delay or ill-adapted response. 
lack of local leadership, it is actually probably the most crucial things. You can say there are plenty of leadership from UNMIR at the very top uh, to the director general of WHO to the local president and the minister of health. But in fact, what is missing is a local, ship, the local uh, leadership at the prefecture or district level. I mean, the one uh, who are going to put uh, the fuel in the ambulance to make sure the brand new ambulance can actually work. And that's uh, simply was the major problems. Um, multiple simultaneous outbreak, true. I think we were above this threshold and that created a lot of problems. And then the external uh, reactions with border and airline closure. We'll come back on that. Um, I just want to stress here the contributing factors when you talk about the context. We often think about the context of the affected communities. Uh, you know, the, the Afri African community in Guinea, in Sierra Leone, and uh, what happened to them. But in fact, you have to think about the context of the medical community, being local or being uh, from outside. You have to think about the, con the social context in a way of the authorities, how that normally works, and the international community. I mean, who people here in Denmark, how they reacted to, to, to these issues. Um, when you come to the local affected communities, yes, strong social customs, yes, burials, at least at the beginning. But in fact, when you look at all the statistics, it shows that the, the main factors were simply the family. You have a case in the family, and cases are, were offered hidden in the family for many, many weeks and contaminated others within the family. But certainly at the, at the initial uh, part of the epidemics and when, when it started to be amplified, it was amplified by burials and of course amplified by healthcare centers. Um, low community awareness, trust, engagement, you can come back to that trying to understand what happened. But it's the first time I saw, particularly in Guinea, and I think it was stronger in Guinea than Sierra Leone and Liberia, a lot of resistance, a lot of hostilities, and a lot of violence. I mean, when I say violence, I mean cars being, uh, vehicles being destroyed, uh, people being hurt uh, or being killed. Um, the population is mobile, but I don't think that's necessarily unique. To such a point that in Guinea, for instance, every day we have a map with all what we call in French the reticence, I mean the resistance. Every day we, mo we monitor these this, um, resistances. So this is just an example, I think, from uh, 4th of December last year. So in red, and that's where we have resistance, and in green, I think it's resistance that is under, more or less under control, but we know we have been, that we have been dealing with resistance. The CVV, CVV stands for Comité de Veille Villageois. It's a, what we call Community Surveillance Committees. And I, here I'm taking a slide from um, preliminary finding from an anthropological uh, investigation by Sheikh Ibrahim Nyang, who is himself from, from Senegal, from Dakar. So, and he stressed the point that women and youth were not involved because in fact, you can imagine that in, in the hierarchy of decision making, it's all about men uh, and adults and elderly. <laughs> So, in fact, if you look at the demographic of these countries, of course, there's a strong base of the pyramids. That means it's a lot of young populations. And when it comes to the, to the, the dead, it's a lot about uh, business for women and, and also the health care at home. It's about women. But unfortunately, this large population of young people and the, popul and, uh, the population of women were not actually very much involved in decision makings. So that certainly was very much stressed by the anthropologists uh, to, to show that. Um, well, this is just a story which we can go in, but there are many similar stories of, uh, of reaction by young people, all our vehicles who have been damaged were actually done by young people, of course, um, and women were often not, in, not involved. What is interesting is women are associated with water in the current uh, cultures and the disease with fire. And in fact, it's very logical that women get involved to extinguish the fire. And the challenge was when the Red Cross workers were primarily men, young men, sometimes not very well educated, so they tend to do what they were asked to do, collect the body uh, and go uh, and do the burial. But the burial, for instance, was in, a, in these body bags. Initially, we were dealing with, um, with um, black bags and um, and that was unac not accepted because normally uh, they have to be, it has to be white because white resembles more the, um, the clothing that you normally put on the dead. So there's a lot of things like that which were so important to get the acceptance <coughs> by the community. But in previous outbreak, we normally managed to also to organize uh, rituals around burial ceremonies. 
to, uh, from a distance with the dead, but at least the family can see the dead. Because when it's within the body bag, they're not sure it's their own relatives. So there are a lot of things which were minors in terms of what needs to be done, but that were major in terms of creating resistance. When I mentioned the issue of uh, ambulance not having uh, fuel, that also a major problem because families were willing to cooperate we're waiting outside for hours and hours and hours with the dead or with the sick, patient, sick relatives, and nobody came. So I will not go into too much detail, but just to say it went so high. I mean, at the climax of it, we had uh, eight kills from, Ebo from an Ebola investigation team that was close to Nzere Kore, and I was, on, I was there on the 16th of September. So I was just arriving from Dakar, and we were in the middle of, of this crisis. So it's just to real to realized that the violence could be very high. And it was very much because th when you look at the, the typology of resistance, I think it's mentioned just later, it was about a war. It was perceived as a war against us and a lot of belief that the international community in particular was actually spreading the disease. There are a lot of misinterpretation. Uh, we're not going to each and, and every one interpretation, but sometimes you have some, you, you can understand why they believe it. For instance, in some of the villages, they saw MSF arriving first, and then the disease arriving second. So they say the logic is then MSF brings the disease, and now we're getting, we're getting sick. So there, there is this, um, this uh, perception that we, we, we need to, to counter. Um, resistance, yeah, Red Cross, I mentioned it, re removal of dead bodies, the issue of women. Um, something that also plays a role in the, uh, the mishandling of the whole thing is this Ebola business. There is a huge amount of wealth coming in the countries. Lot of opportunities to get a vehicle, to get a motorbike, to get many things, and also to be paid. So, you know, I'm not going into detail also on that, but um, that was a major issue, and all these things have been more or less addressed by now. This logic of war uh, was very much, they were, these young people were fighting, but really with their heart. They really believed we were going to kill them. We were going to bring the disease there. We, so it took, a lot of time and negotiation involving the young, involving the women to calm the, 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 the situations. Um, community wants to be actor, to talk and to be heard. I think that's a key point. Most of the time they were not sufficiently at least listened to and not sufficiently involved and too much time when they were involved, there were money involved as well and money involved screwed up in a way the, some of the, of the dynamic. Um, Dignity and, yeah. Uh, now I just want to speak about another community. It's a medical community, and that was very true during SARS, during many previous outbreaks. Doctors and nurses, you need to watch them. They don't follow the rules, usually. And they are the first to escape and to take a flight. For uh, in Guinea, it's not mentioned here, but we, I hope your French is good enough <laughs> for some of you. Uh, but it's just to show with, in the cycle, I just show the, the one which involved either a doctor or a nurse or somebody from the lab. And these were the most difficult contacts to follow. They knew what to do, to, because they knew the rules, they, were, they knew how we were going to look for them. Doctors didn't want to be followed up daily by young little people from the, from the Red Cross or from NGOs or from nurses when you are a professor. So they were escaping. They have resources, they could easily go to the airport and take a flight. Uh, but they were not smart enough, they would not go to Conakry Airport, one went, went to Bamako Airport to, to fly to Paris. So we, we have to realize it was very much true during SARS. If you look at international spread of diseases uh, during that, can, that type of event, the medical community is a problem. So I'm saying it, being a clinician myself, but uh, we, <laughs> we have to acknowledge it. Also this strong will, if you are an expat from an NGO or from the UN, to die at home. You believe you have a serious disease. Um, I'm also new Carlos uh, Urbani, and I was in touch with him actually by phone during the, during the SARS outbreak. Uh, he also crossed the border, for instance. I don't know at that time why, but we had at that time from Vietnam also a French doctor that flew back to Paris and, and infected uh, people in Paris. But, and, they, and they will hide. He was, he was actually picked up by the crew, Air France crew, and he says, no, no, don't worry, I'm coughing because I'm allergic and nobody tried to challenge him because it was, he was a doctor. So the medical community, we need to realize they are the first exposed. In fact, if you're looking for cases, look of course at them, and you know the heavy burden they, they share when it comes to being infected. The second symptom after fever, as we often say, is denial. Denial, they just say, no, it cannot be Ebola, it's something else. And so that's very typical also of the medical community. 
seeking for best health care. I mean, they know where the best health care is going to be. The, I mentioned Gabon earlier, Libreville, the person went to South Africa. He was a physician. South Africa, he survived, but he contaminated a nurse. Authorities, despite their best effort, uh, authorities were under pressure. They have to realize uh, that their own context, cultural context, diplomatic communities pushing them to say, well, you need to control. The national economic community, they don't like outbreak, it's not good for business, they're also putting them under pressure. They are simply not familiar with that kind of problems. Um, it's nature and it's magnitude, so they don't know how to, to react. Their communication is the one they used to, which is radio, television, press release, uh, or, and, and that's all they, they know, what, this is what they know. Uh, difficulty to work with so many external partners, the UN NGOs that also created the big uh, uh, mess sometimes and big difficulties. Um, it, it led to actually a lack of cohesion in the policy, uh, you know, up and down, depending we're doing this, we're doing that. Uh, a good, I mean, a will actually to militarize when they see it's out of control or it's taking too long. They want to militarize, but then you amplify the resistance and sometimes you back to square one because uh, contact will disappear. Uh, and again, lack of local leadership. I just want to stress that because I think this is what really hamper. Uh, the response uh, is what happened in the field. And we knew this issue of failed logistics, of unclear uh, decision makers, <coughs> who is the one to make decisions in the, in the local uh, context. Secu and that leads also to security concern. Corruptions, I mentioned it earlier, uh, particularly when it comes to vehicles. And then I will finish with the international community. Uh, international community, this perception that uh, Ebola terror, as passenger ties had got quick, it was even not an Ebola case, but if people tend to see Ebola everywhere in any passengers who is, a, who is African, instead of seeing Ebola, it's actually the European healthcare worker back from the field. That's where they look, should look for Ebola. Closure of border, cessation of flight uh, has been a major hurdle for us because we could not necessarily go on site, not only for the healthcare community, but even the hotels were not receiving what they normally receive to, to run uh, properly. So without going into more detail, I think this slide is from uh, Christiana on the uh, low hazard high outrage. That's for, for, the, for Europe. I think it's a good slide that shows the, uh, how you're less concerned about health risk and more concerned about health risks, depending of, you know, when it's involuntary, you don't control, it's unfamiliar, uncontrollable, or you believe it's uncontrollable, or it's controlled by others, it's unfair, it's acute, and that's typically meet the, the Ebola uh, crisis of that time. So I stop here, I'll be more open for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, thanks for having me. Uh, I think actually my presentation dovetails quite nicely with what you were saying because what I want to say, or what I want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to talk a little bit about the cultural um, factors underpinning responses to this disease. And particularly I'm gonna be focusing a bit more on the kind of the global level and how, particularly how some of these, uh, some of these issues were received um, um, outside of, uh, of, of West Africa. I want to start, my, my starting point may sound um, unlikely um, because I want to start by um, addressing this question of Ebola by looking at neglect. And it may, be, may seem unlikely because after all, this is an issue that has attracted, attracted such a great deal of attention. Media scrutiny has triggered a number of high profile interventions on the part of some states, has triggered even military-driven interventions. So is this issue actually neglected? So it may, be, may start um, or may come across as a, a bit of strange starting point. But what I want to argue is that despite the attention that was given to, this, um, to Ebola, the issue and the broader issues surrounding Ebola have by and large, um, by and large been neglected and they continue to be neglected. So taking the standpoint of neglect in global health is important in my view because it helps us to explain how the world reacted to Ebola and also to gauge whether enough will be done in the aftermath of this outbreak in order to prevent future crises. So I want to make two general points in this presentation. First, in order to fully understand how the world reacted to the Ebola outbreak and why this reaction was not timely or sufficient, 
we need to first come to terms with the nature of neglect in global health, the complex nature of neglect in global health. Second, my second point is that cultural factors are paramount in this story. And I'll be, I will be looking specifically at three factors that help to explain recent responses to this disease. Firstly, the importance of emotions, and not simply interests, in the definition of health policies and priorities. Secondly, I want to talk about the specific emotional processes that were at play and that underlie neglected health issues, and specifically in the case of Ebola, I think you were present as well. Finally, another factor that I think is important is the persistence of a crisis modality of response that falls prey to the short attention span of the media cycle. So let me begin. What do I mean when I speak of neglect in global health? Neglect includes, in my view, includes not simply the disregard for a certain issue, but also the failure to care for that issue in an adequate way. Neglect can pertain to a situation in which the issue is simply disregarded. That could be called neglect by invisibility. Another in which the issue is not considered important. This would be neglect by apathy. And yet another in which the issue is deemed important, but decisive action to address it is not undertaken either because actors with the ability to shape outcomes are not willing to act, this would be neglect by inaction, or are not acting in an adequate way, this would be neglect by incompetence. So it becomes clear that neglect is more than just invis invisibility of an issue. It is also about a moral landscape and in which the issue is deemed something that does not matter, and about a political arena in which effective solutions are not imagined and mobilized. It must also be noted that neglect pertains not simply to specific diseases, but also to determinants and to groups. A disease can be considered neglected, for example, if it is not studied well enough or if decisive steps are not taken to address it. A determinant is neglected when its role in outbreaks, disease incidents, or resilience are not recognized or addressed. A group is neglected when it is systematically placed in a position of vulnerability to disease or excluded from high quality and affordable health care. So from this broad understanding, we can see that in order to gauge whether a particular health problem is being neglected or not, it is not sufficient to ascertain whether it is receiving media or public attention. It is about quality and not quantity of attention. One needs to ask whether there is sufficient awareness of and attempts to address determinants. One also needs to ask whether certain groups are being placed in positions of vulnerability. This is important in the case of Ebola because a frenzy about the disease was not accompanied by a systematic engagement with its broader context, as well as with the different degrees of vulnerability to it. So despite the sound and fury of the headlines, I argue that Ebola as a multidimensional, as a complex reality, has remained neglected. Two examples serve to illustrate this point. First, the description by certain media outlets of Ebola as a new or emerging phenomenon. We all know that that is simply incorrect. Then this overlooks something that you now talked about, a long history of outbreaks and the conditions that have made Ebola outbreaks depressingly regular in certain regions in Africa. It's good, a second example, the focus on preventing contagion and containing disease, which ultimately came at the expense of broader interventions. The emphasis on control and management of crisis, however important, runs the risk of overlooking the broader context that makes the crisis possible in the first place. There was some talk about the importance of health system strengthening, but not enough, to, not enough was done so far to ensure that sustainable and effective health systems are able to deal with future occurrences of this disease. Crucially, and this is something that Canal mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation, there was almost no attention given to the wider social and political context. I'm talking specifically about trusting relations in society, particularly relations of trust between the people and their political elite. Certainly in the case of Liberia, for example, the fact that the people did not trust their leaders to, to be telling the truth about the disease was a serious constraint upon the effectiveness of aid and of the, the effectiveness of, of, of health authorities. So my second major argument today is that cultural factors are crucial when seeking to understand this broad nature of neglect. 
How does neglect happen? How is it reproduced? We cannot fully answer these questions by remaining at a level of interest. That is the now familiar story that neglected issues exist because the powers that be are not interested in tackling them. This is because interests do not emerge in a vacuum. They are determined by the cultural context in which they emerge. And the question that needs to be asked is, how have interests been shaped in such a way that leads to the neglect of important health problems? How are interests being formed? Neglect does not simply derive from pre-existing interests. It is made possible by a set of assumptions that shape how health and disease are seen and that help to determine what is to be considered a priority and, inversely, what is to be dismissed as unimportant. In order to begin to unpack these assumptions, I will focus on one cultural element that is missing in common explanations of neglect. And this overlooked aspect is emotion. Emotion plays an important role in shaping a political imagination that enables disengagement with certain health problems. I want to talk about one emotional process that seems to be particularly pertinent in this case, the case of Ebola and the case of neglect in general, which is abjection. Abjection refers to the act of casting away something or someone, but also to the process of debasing that someone or rendering that someone despicable. In what concerns to the production of neglect, abjection refers to the, to the dynamics through which certain groups are framed or emerge as alien, that is, outside the sphere of moral obligation, disgusting, that is, triggering an unpleasant emotional reaction, and beyond any possibility of improvement. Abjection is an unavoidable feature, in my opinion, of the cultural context in which certain groups are made invisible and in which some actors become emotionally desensitized to the needs and the, suffer the suffering of less privileged others. And I think that a process of objection was present in the case of Ebola. Certainly, there was a degree to which the world paid attention, however briefly, to what was happening in West Africa. And certainly, there were manifestations of empathy and solidarity. But the same forces that made the outbreak noticed by the media and trending in social networks also resulted in the construction of this disease as something exotic, which, in turn, contributed to its ultimate forgetting. Again, two examples here. One example is the August 2014 Newsweek cover controversy over the import of bushmeat into the US and Europe. So-called secret trade of monkey meat that could become Ebola's backdoor to America. Ebola was here linked to backwards African practices and habits that were deemed exotic and disgusting. At the same time, the discrimination and the stigmatization of West Africans living in, in, the West, in Western countries meant that disease was heavily racialized. The framing of Ebola in Western media cannot be separate from this persistent anxiety over certain kinds of groups, their framing as fundamentally different and disgusting, and the threat they supposedly present to the integrity of the political community. And this was accompanied by an under underlying narrative in the media and seeping to the public opinion as well of the African continent as a place of despair and helplessness, a place where things like Ebola just happen and there's nothing that can be done about it except preventing these, these diseases from spilling over to more civilized and more ordered regions in the world. In the case of Ebola then, the constitution of certain groups and practices as abject, that is, as alien, exotic and disgusting, contributed to framing the disease as an African problem that required surveillance, control, and containment. This happened to the detriment of seeing Ebola as a problem of global health governance, of inequality, injustice, and a systematic reproduction of the vulnerability of certain groups and regions. Besides these dynamics of objection, there is another cultural element that I think played an important role in the case of Ebola. And that is, in my view, one of the major weaknesses of our current health governance mechanisms. And that is the excessive preponderance that is given to a reactive modality based on emergency preparedness and crisis management. The crisis modality of response is certainly useful and important when seeking to draw attention 
granted resources and to respond in a swift manner to problems. But at the same time, as the Ebola case has shown, it falls prey to the vagaries of the media cycle. Noise followed by boredom. Hysteria followed by apathy. While swift decisions are important, I'm not denying that, we must not let ourselves remain in a short-term horizon. Short-term policies that fix or contain crisis should not be the sole focus of global health governance. A long-term strategic vision is needed. We require governance mechanisms that are proactive and comprehensive, and that includes strong ethical and political commitments. All right, let me now wrap up. It has uh, become commonplace to say that a Ebola outbreak has exposed once again the flaws of global health governance. I agree. But at the same time, I find it frustrating that we are going over the same debates each time a crisis of this magnitude occurs. Instead of thinking more systematically about the status quo that seems to accept that this crisis will occur, that human ingenuity will somehow find a way to overcome them. Because in the meantime, what we get is unnecessary suffering, unnecessary deaths, and millions worth of wasted resources. And I'm also frustrated with calls for consensus, unity, convergence, or more efficient allocation of resources, simply because I think that we are not all in this together when it comes to global health. We are not united by contagion. We are divided by the global structures and relations that create the privilege of some and the vulnerability of others. And without acknowledging these divisions and tensions, calls for consensus will prove sterile. This is why I think that we, that, that's important that we talk about neglect and we try to understand what are the deep cultural processes that have prevented a truly solidaristic global health. How is it that we have become separated, unable to fulfill our moral responsibility towards the health of distant others? The answer to this ethical question brings us back to culture, but it also brings us to politics. Global health governance is a political matter not in usual petty politics sense of bargaining, balance of power, reciprocity of favors, but rather in the sense that our decisions, our policy priorities, derive from fundamental questions about what kind of political community we want to live in. And Jeremy spoke about the silo culture that, it, it, that exists in, in, in public health education. I agree with that. But I, I think we need public health and health governance to be more strongly connected with ethics and with politics. I know that health institutions, and WHO is, is one example, have been chastised for, being, for becoming politicized, becoming instruments of political agendas. But it would be a mistake to think that we could aim at neutral, apolitical mechanisms, because all public health decisions and policies are underpinned by assumptions, political and ethical assumptions about what kind of world we want to have. So in the aftermath of Ebola, the tendency has been to think that what we need is a more effective technological or pharmacological fix. A vaccine, a more precise surveillance and reporting network, more streamlined processes of containment and triage. I think these can be useful, but they are no, by no means sufficient. We need, first and foremost, a strong political commitment to health as a global public good. And we need strong and autonomous institutions that can promote this vision. This is why I am honored to be speaking here, because despite its flaws and its shortcomings, WHO is still our best hope for upholding an idea of health as a global public good in a solidaristic sphere. Certainly, in the wake of Ebola, there needs to be a serious debate about what went wrong and what needs to change. Some things will need to change in the institutional architecture, perhaps, in the practice of the institution, certainly. I agree with Jeremy that the WHO needs to be more than a managerial secretariat. It has to lead, it has to inspire, again, the role of emotions. There needs to be inspiration. I know that these debates are happening and I welcome them. But let me say that it would be a disaster for global health if the responsibility and the blame were placed only upon the WHO's shoulders and used as an opportunity to further erode this institution, which still provides the only space where democratic, accountable, and participated decision-making in health matters can take place. We need to find the right combination of knowledge, bureaucracy, and democracy 
in our global health institutions. Because ultimately, that is the solution to the enduring problem of neglect in global health. Strengthening democracy, accountability, and participating in decision making. Thanks very much. Well, it's amazing to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming. And I'd first of all like to thank all speakers for their presentations and, and their support. I know all of you are very busy people, so thank you for being here. GHH started in 2004, getting Wellcome Trust support in 2005. Our many partners, the WHO, and I are very grateful for a decade of support, which has allowed us today to be in the 91st GHH seminar. The GHH seminars have meant many things to many people and, and many of our partners. For example, GHH uh, has been considered by some as a means of learning about mistakes made in the past and not repeating them. Others have seen it as a means of redeveloping and adapting strategies that had worked in the past. But to me personally, the GHH project represents an exercise in transparency, where its many stakeholders can talk in open and self-critical ways about the challenges uh, that are facing different health projects. And I think today's seminar is a wonderful, wonderful example of that self-critical element. So thank you for being so free um, uh, about the challenges faced. Um, I do believe that the GHH allows the adoption of interdisciplinary approaches which enable the recognition of many administrative, cultural, social, and political factors, determinants, that can affect responses to health challenges, factors that are often in a state of flux requiring constant study and adaptation. Um, uh, this is just from my experience of working in the field in India. I would now like to welcome questions from the floor. Uh, I've been reminded to remind you that please wait for microphones because we have online participants. I'm sure they would like to know who you are as you ask questions. And we're hoping to get questions from our online attendees as well. Also, can you please identify yourselves when you ask questions? We do want to keep in touch with you and maybe people who are attending online would like to keep in touch with you. We at GHH, all our partners, want people to talk to each other openly and open up lines of communication. So thank you. Please. Sir. Matt Mugin, um, responsible for mental health here at WHO Euro. What I picked up in many of the presentations was how important emotions were in this whole outbreak. And I particularly picked up, you know, in your presentation, words like denial, anger, which reminded me of quite well-known psychological phenomena uh, which would resist. And I was curious to what extent we know very much about the ways mass psychology um, communication interventions might actually help in these kind of processes and might enable us much better to reach this population in a way that would minimize this resistance. And I particularly think we know an awful lot about mass psychology in the Western world. Do we know much about this in, in low-income countries? Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for these excellent presentations. What, what I haven't got, and maybe it's my error, but is the following. If the two of you, Jeremy and Gunnell, you would be there on the 21st of March, right? With the knowledge you have that there could be a potential large spread of the disease, how would you have done a difference? We have heard about emotions, we have heard about the cultural context, we've heard about something I learned in health promotion, which is power, interest, and values. But I haven't yet seen or understood what and how you would make it different with the knowledge you have today. Madam, can you identify yourself, please? Oh, I, I'm Bettina Mena, Program Manager on Climate Change and Sustainable Development. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, I'm Eva Mata, pharmacist and a 
health category analyst for UNOPS. Um, I'm just thinking about the case of the Spanish nurse who got infected. Um, do you know or do you think there was any other uh, way for the Spanish government or any other um, European government to manage the situation? Because there was a, a tremendous fear of uh, getting contact with the, with the disease. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. On the mass psychology, I just don't know. I think it's an area we don't know well. What was interesting in, uh, I think, in the field there, it how rapidly it spread, because we, it's not just one village. I mean, and you, you have to realize it's also broken by political elements, uh, sometimes tribal issues. But overall, the rumor spread very quickly across the entire country. I don't think they all have tweets. They tweets or they. Uh, but it's very clear that it spread very, very fast, uh, probably without any need necessarily of uh, IT, but everybody has a mo mobile phone there. So the, the, the mobile phone may be uh, uh, something which we could use better to address this point, but also which is could easily play against us because it really spread a lot of rumors. The second question on uh, what would have, I mean, uh, what I would have done earlier. I think if I had been on site and with some experience, of course, as I said earlier, I mean, there would be an alert a bit earlier because five cases, uh, five deaths of the area is already should bring uh, a certain level of alert in, in an endemic area. Um, I will certainly immediately invest better in local leadership because I rely only on the local prefet and the local. Uh, leaders, political leaders were there, but were not really the right one when it comes to operations. And I will certainly also be more careful on the advice advice given to the government or to the, the responders to ensure this is very clearly not a cholera response, but an Ebola response. Um, and it, was, it should have been done before the threshold was, right, was reached. Uh, above a certain threshold, things probably become extremely uh, complicated in the way we, we saw them. And on the Finnish nurse, I don't know which one you are referring to. Uh, Spanish, uh, well, actually I've put Span, Spain, because I say, well, that's probably one. Spanish, okay. No, uh, I think it's interesting because it shows in, uh, in countries which are relatively well equipped. They are well equipped, as many of us, in the, probably in Denmark as well, but are not used to. And that's the key issues. Um, in most of the time, and I remember on pandemic preparedness, for instance, we visited many countries. Um, nobody wants, nobody knows actually how to dress properly. Nobody, and only surgeons still have some know-how. But there is a total loss of infectious disease knowledge, no know infection control. And even during SARS, we see at the very beginning um, the issue of Google, for instance, were not were not there. So it just showed that uh, in Spain, it takes a week, two weeks to adapt to the situations. It's not enough to have the resources, you need the right skills, and you do well what you do often. And it's true that on infectious disease and infection control, we are not often, I mean, if you are a clinician or a nurse, you're not often asked to, to, do, to do so. So that would be my answer. Yeah. <coughs> I also can't address the issue that you raise about psychology, I'm afraid, but I'll leave that for others. Um, I think the question you ask about what would you have done differently is a very important question, and, and we, it, in all honesty, may still be too early to have learnt the right lessons, I suspect. But, but I think in trying to not just avoid the question, um, I do think those, if, if you're now just talking about the response, and I put aside the critical issues that have been raised about it not just being a crisis management, but there is an essential crisis management role um, because ultimately an epidemic does have to, um, the curve of the epidemic has to be um, changed and it is possible to change it by action. Um, so I just focus on the crisis, although fully accept that that is only looking at one element of it. I do think that there was, um, uh, and this is where we may slightly disagree. Um, I do think there was needed to be an earlier recognition that 2015 is not 1976. Um, I do think the social context that it was occurring in was very different, uh, although there have been urban outbreaks before, not at this scale and not at this geographical spread. And, and therefore, the need across three countries and then more for a really coordinated response with multiple players who were, as we heard earlier, filling different perceived or real vacuums or gaps would have would have assisted it, um, earlier 
than uh, was initiated. And, and again, it goes back to my comments about silos. Different um, organizations and, and people arguing that they had the answer. Whether the answer was a social one, a cultural one, an anthropological one, or a vaccine one, or a drug one, or a farm one, the truth is that none of those on their own can be an answer. And that the skill for the future is to realize the strengths and weaknesses of all of those and get them all to work together. Because it's the synergy between those that will actually um, make a difference rather than seeing them in isolation. So I think anybody that argues from any of those silos that that single silo will be the answer, I think that's where we learn, need to learn in the future to work in a different way. Yeah, so uh, we have um, two questions from the internet sphere. Um, one is from Doug Milford, and this is really looking at uh, um, taking some of the lessons learned about culture, um, cultural context, and, and looking at um, a different question. And he asks, um, are there any applications of cultural lessons learned in, Ebola, in the Ebola crisis um, as they relate to the anti-vaccination movement? So uh, um, is there any, any transfer of knowledge there? Um, and then we had another question. Um, it was said that the world needs a very strong WHO. Um, how can we make WHO fit for this purpose? <laughs> As, uh, the WHO speaker, do you want to start off? You can. Okay, I can give it to RD eh, to respond <laughs> on that on what should be done. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be involved because I'm going back to Geneva. Uh, Margaret asked me to come back, so. But I keep my ideas <laughs> for myself. Um, um, First of all, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, we had a unique Ebola outbreak, so completely different from the other, that until we reach a crisis level, I don't, in fact, I don't understand why we went to such a crisis. That's my point. I mean, at the, at the beginning, it looks like many others, except that in this part of Africa, we were not used to it. So why we went to such a crisis, an humanitarian crisis on top of the epidemic, that really make it unique, that I, I fully, fully agree. Um, on the cultural lesson on anti-vaccination, since I'm in charge of uh, immunization here. I'm looking at Rob, actually. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's such a different context. I mean, uh, there's a, there may be some lessons to, to be learned, but it seems to me that the Western society is, is quite different from, from the society in West Africa. I don't think... But there may be some, some ideas on uh, this idea of mass uh, psychology. I mean, how to address it. I, I know Rob, we have an expert on these issues, Rob Butler, but he's not with us. He's a uh, on his way back from Romania, uh, he will have answered that. So if, if the person over the internet is interested, can always contact Rob Butler, who has already done a lot of work on, in this area. Of course, uh, with great pleasure. Uh, what I want to say is that, of course, in the GPG, the Global Policy Group, we are analyzing all the time what happened and what were the, the mistakes that were made. And the WHO is and will be the first one to admit that mistakes were made in the first phase, and I agree with Jeremy on this. And we are analyzing it, we are learning from it, we are doing the reform of the emergency, the Category 5 in our work, and I hope that that will make WHO a stronger organization. However, we also have to admit that many times WHO was used as a scapegoat and uh, and it's very true, and it's not only me saying it, it's coming out in meetings more and more, used, for the, used as a scapegoat for many different, very complex political gains that were going on. And I am not saying it formally and officially as a regional director, I'm saying it as Susanna Jakob, but that is the truth. And we discussed it also in GPG, and that is the reality, and we have to live with that. Um, of course, we were not good enough in communicating and coming up with counter-arguments. And also the fact, uh, Gunnar already referred to that, that we are dealing with outbreaks and emergencies and public health emergencies, humanitarian crises, on a day-to-day -day basis. We have huge success stories to tell in the organization over the last years and decades. And now we make a mistake, and this, this is taken out of this context, and nobody remembers the success stories, only remembers the failure, which was a joint failure of everybody. You said it, Jeremy, and I fully agree with you. 
So there is also this political element of WHO being used as a scapegoat in this for the failure of the whole international community. And we have to remember that, and that that's, that's, that's a lesson learned. And we have to put it on the table because this is a reality. Of course, we will improve our work. We will improve our emergency work. I'm sure that the DG will take a full proposal to the executive board in January, which comes from the stocking report, which will come also from the report that the UN Secretary General's working group uh, has pulled together and from our own experience. We will improve our work in emergencies. We are working very hard in the whole organization on the WHO reform in the last few years, uh, as you also suggested. The SDGs will be also extremely helpful in this regard because the SDGs, which is nothing else than an integrated approach, a very broad public health approach, which puts a lot of emphasis on the determinants of health in the various goals, uh, even where health is not directly included and also in the indicators, that is nothing else than a health in all policies approach which will help our health agenda and it will help the broad public health uh, approach. So I'm sure that the organization uh, will come out stronger from this uh, exercise and stronger as a leader. And you also mentioned, Jeremy, that we need strong public health leadership. We agree fully with that. But we, of course, also need very strong leadership um, globally and also in the European region, not only in public health, in all the other aspects of our work. And there is, in a way, a leadership crisis. Uh, we have seen it yesterday in the European Parliament. We needed the two top leaders from Europe to go there and to speak and to reassure. There is a leadership crisis in Europe. There is a global leadership crisis. And, uh, of course, I agree with you that public health needs to be put back in its broad sense and WHO should be strengthened in that leadership. This work is ongoing. What you said was music to our ears because the same issues are always discussed in the assembly, in the executive board, and the regional committee more recently. So work is ongoing. I'm sure we will strengthen the organization. But there is a political element, and that is my key message, that we cannot say in the open governing bodies meeting. We can say it here between the friends. And that should also, we should always bear it in mind when uh, there is a lot of criticism on the public health work. And we should put it into the global context and see also the successes, not only the failures. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't think I've got anything to add. I, I agree with all of that. And I'd reiterate what I said earlier. I don't think the world has ever, uh, the need for a strong WHO has never been greater. Yes, um, the response to how to make the WHO fit for this purpose. I mean, I broadly agree with what has been said here. I think it hasn't been mentioned yet, but it seems to be kind of quite obvious and quite fundamental, which is WHO needs to be able to decide where it spends its money. So I think a lot of the problems in the WHO are connected with its funding structure. The fact that it has no autonomy or has a, its, its hands tied to a certain degree because it, all of its funds, or well, not all, but a great percentage of its funds are earmarked. So I think it's fundamental that the, the WHO is able to decide, as an autonomous body, how it best uh, will will apply its its funds. So yeah, I think I think that's the only thing I'd like to add. Thank you. My question is quick. I don't know if uh, the answer is quick, but uh, the first speaker spoke a lot about uh, the weak uh, health system uh, that uh, we had in this country that was the cause of uh, many of the troubles. Now, I, we stated many times that in uh, European countries, so in North America, where the health system is more strong, uh, it would be more difficult to see such a dimension of outbreaks. I think uh, I wonder, always wonder if uh, this uh, statement was done not to make panic, or there was uh, some studies, uh, some modeling uh, that uh, studied the impact uh, of such an epidemic in the Western countries. Because I saw in Italy we had only two cases. And if you see the amount of people, health workers, uh, that were around these two cases, I wonder what happened if we had 1,000 cases. Then, of course, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, we don't have uh, we don't have the problems of the, we have more awareness about burial, we have different culture, 
But we have also a different uh, way of living, a much more urban way of living. Uh, we have uh, millions of places where we are crowding. Uh, cinema, stadium, uh, gym, uh, saunas, uh, whatever. So I, I'm not really sure that a better health system could really uh, limit the, the disease. And I wonder if there is some studies on that. Thanks. Ah, okay. My name is Luigi. I'm sitting in the, at the office. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Luigi, for the, the questions. Uh, in fact, you raised the question of the vulnerability <coughs> of, the, of the developed world. And if you just look uh, back to SARS, for instance, that was amplified not in the developing world. It was amplified in very modern hospitals, in Hong Kong, in Beijing, in Toronto, uh, we were in, uh, in Singapore. We were not dealing with uh, Kinshasa or Libreville. So we need to keep in mind that vulnerability is actually is there uh, because infection control it's not that we cannot make it happen, we, we can, but there is this, uh, this uh, know-how which is, which is not there, it takes some time to adapt. But I think the key protection we have is uh, certainly the quality of life, I mean the, the quality of housing and transport, but we in some areas, like, like buildings for instance, there have been a lot of uh, work done during the pandemic, influenza pandemic, to realize that some, um, some building could be actually uh, could sustain transmissions because you have a, you don't cannot open windows. The, the, the air go from the ground floor up to the fifth floor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are s many things are built now without thinking about uh, vulnerability to infectious diseases, and that certainly needs to be to be looked at to make sure we build st strong hospitals and also the our way of life to not make us do not make it uh, make us uh, vulnerable. So that's all I I, uh, I could say on the I think on the on these issues of Western world. Could I, just, uh, could I just briefly add something to that? Because I think the, the certainly public health systems are determinant and are, are crucial for responding to these kinds of problems. But I think also important is whether, you know, is the, the social context in which these health systems are located. What is the use of having state-of-the-art hospitals if people don't use them, if people don't go to them because they don't trust them? We know that in the case of Ebola, there was a serious problem of people just under-reporting cases. They were not going where they were told to be going because they did not trust their health authorities. And this was connected with the fact that they did not trust their political authorities, period. Okay, so the question is not just about what kind of health system you have in terms of equipment, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of resources, of staff, etc. It's also about whether the public trusts these, um, uh, th th these people, trusts th th these, these ways of, of dealing with the problem. Just, uh, I think you raise a very important issue, and I, I think being optimistic about the future, the, the, the world does have to realize, and maybe it's realized it, I don't know, uh, during Ebola, and it certainly should have done during SARS, that actually we're all vulnerable, um, and that and that we are all we all have to be in this, and that the inequalities are will, will drive much of it, and that why whilst nation states will be the primary drivers of delivery of public health at the national level, there is a desperate need for a global organisation that brings us all together because we are all going to be vulnerable at various times, uh, and I think we've lost sight of that a little bit in the last 10 or 20 years uh, with, with uh, uh, the neglect um, that we heard about earlier. And maybe, maybe out of this crisis, that sense that actually we're all vulnerable um, will help the world rethink its global architecture. I'm uh, going to give the floor to the RD for some final comments very soon. But before we wrap up, I want to thank Niels and Claudia for your tremendous support. Uh, I, I, I haven't identified myself after telling all of you to identify yourselves. I'm Sanjay Bharacharya. I represent the WHO Collaborating Center for Global Health Histories at the University of York. And then on behalf of my center, I'd also like to finally thank the speakers once again uh, and our colleagues, WHO colleagues in Geneva, who have also supported us, especially Jing Wang Kavalanti, who I think is online. So thank you all. And Adi, please. Just to thank all the WHO collaborating centers, including the ones that are here present. They support our work tremendously. 
and uh, I encourage our colleagues to involve them even more in our activities. And special thanks to the Wellcome Trust, not only for the presentation today, but also during the last few years for supporting our activities for secondment and looking forward to working very closely with you. And we will take on your offer and come and visit you to in London, but you are also welcome to come back here to the, to the regional office and hope to see you around many times. And I'm very much looking forward to the next seminar on the same topic, on a similar topic, I mean, on migration and health in a one month's time. Thank you. Thank you.